This is what Manila will look like in sea level rise in worst case scenario. Metro Manila will disappear. Metro Manila will disappear. Which is why I asked earlier. And you know, Metro Manila is expecting a major earthquake. A major earthquake. It's 200 years late. And Solidum, who was here, said that it, just this week, this will be the impacts on Metro Manila. 31,000 dead, 100,000 severely injured, 100,000 buildings damaged, bridges and roads down, water mains will be split at 4,000 points, energy problems, cell phone systems will go down because they're on the buildings that are damaged. Many things you experienced here during the Paul earthquake and worse. Yun ang mangyayari sa Metro Manila. Bakit? Kukunti lang kayo dito. Mas mas konti ang tao sa Bohol. Density. Sa Maynila, eh, close, Metro Manila is close to 14 million. So, people are packed like sardines. So, yung concentrated risk makikita natin. After Tacloban, after Bohol, you saw things like this, right? Photograph taken inside a Hercules after Yolanda, last year. Where did all these people go? Last week, I was in Ilocos Norte, and Mayor, uh, Governor Marcos was telling me, they're here, they're here in Ilocos Norte. <laughs> Imagine, meron sa Ilocos Norte. Mayor, mabila ko, Filipino was saying, pinapauwi ko na nga eh. Ako nagbabayad sa mga, andito pa rin sila eh. No? It's, uh, they're all over the place. Now, that's many like 15 million people. Even if we don't have that severe sea level rise, if that earth earthquake hits, how many of them do you think will come to Cebu? <laughs> I'm, giving you a, I'm giving you a real scenario here. You're seeing a population increase in the next 20 years of maybe half a million people over your current population of 800,000. Can you take half a million people in a week? There are 15 million people who will, are going to be looking for places of shelter. Think about it. Think about it. This is the normal growth expected of Visayas and Mindanao. Normal population growth. Because being in region 6 and in region 7, of course. Region 6 more, than, slightly more than region 7. But two of the biggest here. Now, what if you imagine you have half a million spike in one year? Then, mawawala na lang sila sa records. Hindi naman magpapasedula yan eh. So, they'll just disappear. That's the business choice. Are you simply accepting forced migration as a reality? Or will we opt for plant development? And if we will opt for plant development, how do we avoid the situation of Tacloban City? which took a whole year just to make decisions. But think about it now. We have to be more proactive. Cities are areas of concentrated risk because cities are unsustainable. Metro Manila is unsustainable. Metro Manila gets its water from the Sierra Madre. It gets its power from outside, maybe even from Leyte. It gets its food from outside, from Bulacan, from Region 4. It gets its labor from outside. <coughs> That's why we have such much traffic. At, in the daytime, there are only half a million people who live, at nighttime, only half a million people who live in Makati. In the daytime, it goes up to four million. This is crazy. Unsustainable. And since they are resource uh, scarce, they are dependent on trade, right? The objective is to decentralize. Create areas of attraction that will encourage people to move out. What am I talking about? Some of you have had a chance to work or live in Metro Manila for a while. When Manila was a little town and I was a little boy, um, somebody decided, oh, let's start developing in, I guess some city was already there in San Juan, but let's start developing in Green Hills. I once walked Ortigas Avenue when it was a dirt track. I was a Boy Scout and we walked, it was an actual hike, because it was dirt. And um, let's build Green Hills. And wow, it was like, wow, nice, we went roads. 
Si Mentrons lang. Okay na sila. Okay, good. Then said, oh, somebody's building in, this Makati was built already. Let's build uh, Das Marinas village. Let's build BF homes. Let's build in Paranaque. Let's go into Alabang. And all these new developments became prettier and better and more attractive. People were not forced to relocate. They chose because they had schools. They had hospitals, they had supermarkets, the roads were nice, the villages were nice. No? So I'm not saying force people. Decentralize by creating attractants. How do you create a better option so people can live where they work, so they don't have to travel so far? You know, the things which irritate you. I have to travel so far, I have to go. And, and that way, by decentralizing, you not only spread the risk, you also share the opportunity. To allow people in other towns up toward the now, further up even to develop. Why? Why not? It's their rights. This is a photograph of Metro Manila, but this could also apply to Cebu City. Right? So, <clears throat> each city, as it moves toward the track to deal with climate change, has a number of things it has to deal with. And that includes things such as air, water, food, ecosystem services, etc., etc., etc. All these things have to be dealt with. I said earlier it is not cut and paste. Some of them can do many at the same time. Some can only do one or two at a time. That's fine. Each city can move at its own pace. But these are things that have to be paid attention to by every city in government. The end objective being self-sufficiency. In a conference in Makati a couple of months ago, a regional business forum, we were talking about food security and, and uh, the experts of the world were saying, no, food security is different from self-sufficiency. I said, what do you mean? Because food security can be ensured by trade. For example, Singapore is food secure because it buys all its food. Okay. I said, but uh, in an extreme weather situation, who's going to trade, right? Unless you have big, big, big bodegas of food and water and all these things available. So uh, it, it's the persons who are prepared. So self-sufficiency is another objective, different from food security. For me, self-sufficiency is like your wallet. It's like your back pocket. And food security is your bank account. <laughs> but you have something here, just in case you have something here. So it's, not, it's like your savings account. It's here. It's, and it's something which you should have, at least for basic things. If you cannot be food, let's say, self-sufficient for rice, maybe you can be self-sufficient for kamote, who knows? <laughs> taro chips, who knows? So you have uh, taro chips and some, don't have instant noodles, please, it's bad for your kidneys. <laughs> uh, but uh, th this, this is the point I'm trying to make. It's not enough to be food secure. You know, we, many of us have worked in social development, or trying to help our country stand up for many years. And you know, some of the things we've done have actually made a difference. The United Nations now says that globally we're going to see a new global middle class emerge, estimating in the area of 2 billion people. People who are now slightly richer, more empowered, better educated, have good jobs, moving ahead. If that happens, it is their right to say, well, I want to live a good life too. And so they will have the right and the financial capacity to consume. And it may reach a point where people of the Philippines may say, wait, let's stop exporting that stuff. Kami muna. Right? Why should the guy in Hong Kong eat the lapu, -lapu? Why can't we eat the lapu, -lapu first? I'll pay the lapu here, I'll pay for it. Then what happens to people who are dependent on outside? So you have certain things you have to be self-sufficient. We have to learn how to look at ecosystems as the way we manage these relationships. Cities have to look beyond political boundaries. Up beyond our fences. Because the water drains past your fence and comes from somewhere else above your fence. So we have to look at it that way. Remembering that the poor depend on the environment for their social security system. When things go bad, they go back to nature. They get water and food from nature. They get charcoal from trees that you may have planted in the highlands, in the hilly lands of Cebu many years ago. But if they
they have no other choice. So, there are a number of key result areas I think I suggest Cebu and all the cities in Uganda to look at. One, define land use. I'm showing these two photographs. One of Lupang Arenda, in which I'm the largest informal settler colony of this NCR. And two, a mine site in southern Bolivar. We have to define land use. This is Baku City. When urbanization advances, agriculture retreats. And therefore, the rural urban lifeline becomes more and more important. The rural urban lifeline is what we call farm to market roads. But without that, unless you can deliver the gulai and the kalabansi and the. Okay? No access, no business. No business, no economy. 60% of the land in the Philippines is classified as agricultural food production and therefore every time you increase unregulated land conversion the heaviest impact is going to be on food production food security is one of our musts we have to figure out how to sustainably produce more with less more and more young filipinos are leaving the farms they don't like the farms they all want to work in a BPO, in a BPO. They all like to have a Madonna headset. <laughs> and um, have a cell phone. They all want to be cool. But, you know, we have to figure out, if we don't want GMOs, then we have to find solutions. Because you go to Isabella, and every single pork farm is already using Monsanto corn. So, um, if you don't want that, you have to find solutions. For example, in the environmental field, we've used protected areas as a technology to help conserve areas of high biodiversity. In the business field, government has used the economic zone as a way to create more efficiencies, to be able to focus services uh, needed for more efficient processing of export activity, like Makta. Why don't we have food production zones? Why aren't there areas where smallholders and large companies can exist together in a more efficient system, where large companies can provide agricultural extension, training, can help share financing access, things like this, which smallholder farmers would not have. Help them figure out how to deal with insurance. Which city can live without food? Why are we paying attention to exports and to protected forests and we're not paying attention to creating more efficient food production baskets? I asked this of Kiko Pongilin and I said, please, we have to look at this. Because just more with less, we have to create more efficiency. They cannot just be, you cannot just leave it to uh, big farmers. You have to figure out how to include the small farmers because the land is theirs. There's a role for each of us as well. Dito sa Pilipinas, we have a very uh, sad practice of leaving the food behind, di ba? Nakakahiya naman, tatubusin ko yung huling longganisa, o yung huling ano ng kanin. That's the shy piece of the Filipino piece. You know, if we get all those shy pieces and put it together, we can feed two and a half million people. So, food for food efficiency, there is a role for each of us to play. I want to talk a bit about fisheries and protein. It won't last. I gave you the climate scenarios. You have the population figures. It won't last. We have to learn how to grow our own fish. And when you look at the conversion ratios, fish makes much more sense than chickens or pigs or cows. My apologies to Bantaya. It does make more sense. And especially something like bagus. You know, bagus is a herbivore. Lapu-lapu is a carnivore. For a lapu-lapu, to get to one kilo size, it has to eat the equivalent of seven fish, seven kilos of fish. Let's, let us support and promote our own. Mamus may be the fish of the future, not tilapia. Okay. But you see, we're saddled with problems like this. <laughs> this is so old school. 
What's the big joke about Laguna de Bay? Everybody wants to have a fish pen in Laguna de Bay. Why? Because you don't have to feed the fish. It's a high nutrient lake. Why is it a high nutrient lake? Because it's the septic tank of Metro Manila. <laughs> a good businessman does not treat the consumer that way. You do it the right way. You do it the right way and make sure you have healthy fish that's not growing in polluted water. This is the same problem we've seen in the Miko. How many people in this room have tried cream dory? Cream dory, raise your hands, come on, guilt free, cream dory. <laughs> cream dory is pangasius, no? And pangasius is really a relative of hito. That's all it is. Hito is an omnivore, it eats everything. That's a nice way of saying kumakain ng basura yan. <laughs> now you're wondering, why is pangasius white, hito is yellow, yung laman? Because they bleach it. They got like it in zone rocks. <laughs> there are no guarantees. But you see, the, 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 why, why is cream dory such a success? It's cheap. That's the same reason why they want to grow here. It's cheap. They can keep their price low. But many people have used it. It's cheap. It's convenient. It's filet. Wala nang tinik. Nakaready na. So if you can figure out how to do that, and we can. We have to invest in the essentials for local self efficiency, and I'm very proud of this. You see those fish swimming in the background? That is an, an Alson's in the Alcantara farm in Sarangani Bay. That's the largest uh, hatchery for bamboos in the Philippines. They supply 50% of the Philippine fry for bamboos in that one little laboratory. We can do this all over the country. And you see those green bottles? That's in Dagupan. That's in the BFAR facility in Dagupan. That's the food for bamboos that they grow right there. And you can see, it's not meat, it's gulai, it's it's, it's. Lumut. Opportunities here in Cebu. Singapore, Taiwan, even Shenzhen is already investing in urban agriculture. I once talked to the people of Hagunoi because their fishing ponds are constantly going underwater and therefore tumatakas yung isda. Sabi ko, Mayor, Pili niyo yung pitong pinakamayaman dito, pinakamalaking kalaisdaan. Pumili kayo ng lupa sa Cubao, sa tabi ng farmer's market, magtayo ka ng building, seven stories. Doon nyo iligay yung isda. He thought I was joking. Mayor, pupunta ko sa Taiwan, ginagawa na nila yan. Matakaw sa kuryente. Boss, haven't you heard of solar? <laughs> Meron eh. Eh, pops lang yan, filters. Madali lang yan. The circulation yan, yeah. submersible pumps lang yan. Yeah. You see this, this is, uh, these are uh, internal, oh, this is uh, inside, indoor so, uh, fish tanks in Taiwan. And they, they figured out that instead of sunlight, they can use red and uh, blue LED lights to get the same effect. So, uh, th it's being done in other places. And I told the mayor, wala na yung freight cost mo, wala na yung freezing cost mo. Kasi katabilun palengke. That's the secret of urban agriculture. You have it right beside where it's needed. It not only lowers or stabilizes the cost of food, it also helps provide you a backup in the case in case there's an emergency. Now I don't know how a building like that will behave in a seven earthquake, no, pero. <laughs> Let's talk about water now. Water. We get so much rain. We only we get 146 billion cubic meters of rain a year. But we only use 20 billion. Everything else goes to the sea, or we lose it to the leaks in the pipe system. There will be changes in the quantity, in the quality, and the timing of water. I showed you the rain charts, Kanina. These are the three highest cities for rainfall, and these are the three lowest cities for rainfall. And this is Cebu. What do you see? Medyo nasa low side din yun. Tsaka mukhang hindi tumataas yung trend. Mukhang flat, no? Mukhang flat. Pero do you notice high variability? So when we were talking to Iliwilo about an all-weather road program, we told them, you plan for variability, you plan for highest and lowest. Because it's more expensive 
but if you want to keep your port connected to your airport, connected to your town, at least for one highway, you have to plan for the worst case for one highway. Right? Essentially, the management of flooding has to do with detention and conveyance. Essentially, most Philippine cities are not designed that way. This is a study we, uh, we did in Santa Rosa, Laguna. It could be any of the other four cities you see on those tabs. They're designed to be uh, flood prone. Drainage systems are left alone. Double city. Remember the flood two, three years ago where hundreds of people drowned in Davao? Matina Pangi, the other places there. A study was made by the Ateneo de Davao in 1998 from Mayor Rodrigo Duterte where they told him there are six points along the drainage system of the Davao coastline that are in urgent need of upgrading because the drainage pipes are American era. That's what they had to be made large. The plan of Mayor Duterte was to borrow money from the World Bank and then to build the system. Turns could not run again. His vice mayor took over. His vice mayor borrowed the money from the World Bank and built the sports stadium. <laughs> Sounds family. And then what happened? Those six spots are where the people drowned. They knew it. Many of the things that are happening here, you guys knew in 1990s, right? So we are not, we are designed this way. We should actually be looking at flood neutral planning where you, okay, you have to look at your watersheds. Nothing wrong with planting trees, but it's not enough. You think planting trees is gonna save you, you've got a good something to think about. Camotes Island did not achieve zero casualty because of trees. They achieved it because they evacuated. You see? So don't think I, I planted 1,000 trees. It's not going to flood in Cebu. Mm. Mm. You have to look at other engineering interventions. For example, I was talking to Secretary Babe Singson. He was saying, Laurie, what do you think of detention ponds? These are little dams, little areas where you can hold the water. Good idea. I said, sir, it will only take one year to build that. It takes 10 years to grow a tree. So while the tree is growing, you put those ponds in place. It reduces the amount of water that goes down to the city and therefore reduces the amount of water that your drains need to handle. Does that mean that you you don't have to worry about your drains? No, you still have to fix your drains. You still have to clear your esteros. Go to Iliwilo. They've done a great job. They're still flooding, but they keep working at it. <laughs> they keep trying to figure out how they can improve that further. Everyone has a role to play. There are interventions that can be done at catchment scale, the whole ecosystem, at city scale, at site scale, or at building scale. Traditionally, we have focused on two things, extraction and conveyance, deep well and drain. That's our focus. We should also be looking at two, three other things, absorption, how we can get more water back into the aquifer, Detention, how we can hold water so it does not all go down to the sea town and can be used for other purposes. And reuse. Reuse. Some of you may not know, but SM here uses the water two or three times before it throws it away. And I think everybody should be using water two or three times before it's thrown away. Gray water can be used for other things. It cannot be just you. You're using perfectly good water from the water district to wash your car. It makes no sense. Or to water your plants. You can use gray water for that. Everyone has a role to play. And there is a solution at every scale. And I love this picture showing this little boy. Everyone has a role to play. Baguio City has the highest rainfall in the country. Our average rainfall is 2,400 millimeters, 6,000 millimeters of rain. And yet everybody gets their water from the water district that gets their water from wells. Nobody catches rain. The city was designed for 50,000 people. There are now 360,000 people at night. In the daytime, one million. And nobody gets their water from the rain. 
when we were having a meeting like this in Palgio, I asked, let me see a show of hands. How many people in this room catch rain and one hand went up? Parang nakakahiya to catch rain. Why? Why? Diba? Think about that. Singapore has set the stage for multi-source water. Multi-source water. In Tacloban, when that happened, if you had a multi-source water system, well, of course, if your house was still standing up, if you had a multi-source water system, you would be able to have some water. Um, tra traditionally, rain should be your first priority because it has the largest amount of water. Then surface water, rivers, ponds, detention areas. Then your last choice should be groundwater. But in the Philippines, unfortunately, balik the June. We go after the groundwater first. Okay? Now, before you go underwater like Hagonoi, the first sign you will see is what's happening in Maxilom, which is salt water intrusion. That comes before flooding. What is the effect on some places? Four years ago, three islands in the, the Nahon Bank, sitting just east of Cebu, had to be evacuated because their wells were all salty and their crops were dying and they could not survive. They were never flooded, but they had to evacuate. See, so this is not a solution. How much do you pay for a liter of bottled water? 20? 12? 15? 15? 15? In Manila, we pay 20 for a liter. Okay? How many liters are there in one cubic meter? A thousand. Oh, how, mu how much do you pay Metro Cebu Water District for one cubic meter of water? In Manila, we pay 27 pesos to Manila Water. 15 pesos? 15. 15 pesos. Mas 15 pesos per cubic meter. Okay, you multiply 20 pesos per liter times 1,000 liters equals 20,000 pesos per cubic meter for bottled water. Okay, it's convenient if you have somebody sick in the house, if you have a baby, if you have an old person. But as an everyday thing which has become, this is too expensive. If you are only being charged 15 pesos by Metro Cebu or by Manila Water, and we're being charged 27, we cannot. This is cost of living. This is what the UN calls maladaptation. We have to manage water. That is a KRA. We also have to look at our energy mix. Okay, we are saying that the WWF has always been saying that renewable energy is the way to go. And we believe it is. But we're saying, look, let's talk about our balanced energy mix. Why? Again, the same principle, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, president Aquino is my president. I believe in the electoral system and he won. And until 2016, he's my president. But after that, he's not my president anymore. Will it mean that I will not campaign for him or I will campaign for him? That has nothing to do with it. But this is a free country and as a democracy, I don't have to agree with what he says or what he does. And I don't agree with his decision to approve 4,500 megawatts of coal. Why? It's nothing to do with pollution. It has to do with cost. The IEA has released this chart showing that over the next 20 years, the cost of coal and oil is going to go in one direction, up. This will affect the cost of doing business. It will affect the competitiveness of our country. It will affect the cost of living. And therefore, it will be affect the cost of political office. Rather than attacking this more, let me ask you four questions. What is the reality of base load? Do we have sufficient energy? Do we control? supply and the price of that? Is it cheap or is it expensive? Aren't we the most expensive in Asia? And do we have brownouts? If you run a company, if you bought equipment, if you bought a cell phone, if you bought a car, and after a while it stopped performing the way you expect, would you look for a new one? Let's say you bought a pair of rubber shoes for uh, jogging or for basketball, and after a while you find you keep on getting tapilok. Won't you buy a new pair of, of, of athletic shoes? You will. Base load hasn't worked. It's expensive. 
we don't close supply, we still have brownouts. So we're not saying, jump this. That's not the way a mature person thinks. You're saying, balance it off, spread the risk. We're saying, look, I have a friend who has a restaurant in, near Baguio City, and he bought two solar panels, and he put it up. And that day, he like, brown out. And he realized that he was the only one on the street with cold beer and hot coffee. <laughs> so there is a competitive element here. Three years ago, I talked to Hansi of SE and I was encouraging him to go solar. And he was oh, still thinking about it. And, and partly many people were trying to convince him to go solar. This year, he announced that he would set up solar facilities in North Edsa and one and a half megawatts. And apparently this young kid, the son of Lorne de Garda, convinced him. He said, okay. The kid came with a good package plus financing. Pa, so they don't have to buy it. They just buy the power, right? I said, what made you? It's not the financing deal. BDO can finance it yourself. But why do you have, what's the, what did it made you? He said, you know, <coughs> I won't be able to supply all my power. But I will be so able to supply power during peak load when the prices of power are the highest. And that's when solar works the best. And that's the amount that I will save. Let's say I can save 25%. And 75% I buy from Meralco. And my competitor buys 100% from Meralco. And Meralco goes up as it always goes up. After a while, my friend will be paying 100% times 20%. I will be all paying 75% times 20%. The rest stays at the lower cost. Cost. It's cost. And in a brownout, you, still have, you can still run your air conditioning. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> Ilocos Norte has one of the best managed energy mixes in the country. Why? You see, what many people don't realize is that all, virtually all areas who generate power, all plants, as long as you're not in a spug or a subsidized power area, you have to sell to Napucor. Geothermal, they have to sell to Napucor. Tumaran sells to Napucor. They cannot go straight to Leyte, except for two, solar and wind. What are the two types of power plants that Ivy Marcos is building in Ilocos Norte? Solar and wind. That means the Ilocanos, can use the power, and they will only sell the leftover to Nampur. And they will use the power at the cost that they get it. Wala nang pato. Now, if you had a microwind system in your store, in your home, in your resort, you can use that power as well. You don't have to buy it from the network. Um, that's what they call prior dispatch. And you can only do that with solar and with wind. This is a key result here. <clears throat> Briefly about education. Our, this is nothing to do with our formal education system. But the formal education system is already tied up with hard copy thinking. They're in brick and mortar minds. And um, I'm worried more about the people who will drop out of school at grade four and move on and uh, never come back into the mainstream. We will never solve our poverty problem if we do not look at the people who fall out. These are fully capable of doing other jobs. They don't have to learn Shakespeare. They don't have to learn, you know, uh, uh, classical music. But if they learn how to use their hands and to use their brains and to be useful, rather than to be obigat as a society, they can be good. We have many options available to us, virtual options, online options, radio, television, ways by which people can learn. I was speaking to a seafarer uh, who had worked on a Norwegian ship, Filipino, and uh, he was captain. And I said, when you joined this company, he had been with the, captain, the company for many years, were you a captain? No, 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 I was a deckhand. So how did you know? He said, sir, online. While he was on the ship, he would study, he would, and he would get certified and move up and move up and move up. So there are ways in which you can move up from a very low position if you have access without a formal education system. No? Nobody necessarily needs a BS or an AB or an LLD or an MBA or nobody. 
Those are only letters. The whole idea here is how do we capture the people so the country becomes productive as a whole and that there are less counterboys and stumbies. We have to build brains rather than buildings. I like to tell a story of our past president, Ramon Magsaysay, who once said, if there are not enough classrooms, teach the children under the mango trees. <coughs> now it's believe If there are no classrooms, we don't teach the children. <coughs> It cannot be. There has to be a way. If they fall out, we will catch them. Access and transport, another key result area. <clears throat> there are 40,000 ships a day that go to sea. This image is from a website you can easily download and access. It shows you where all the ships in the world are at any given time. Ships are important to Cebu. This is the volume of shipborne cargo from 1990 to 2010 domestic and international, and the trends. You can see they're clearly upward. This is important to Cebu. Therefore, not just for cargo, also for passengers. Look, it's also growing. I want to go back to the examples I gave earlier of Singapore. Please, let's figure out how we can solve the seaport problem of Cebu. The viability of the Visayas hinges on the viability of Cebu. None of these ports have been retrofitted. None of them. Our airports need attention as well. I earlier showed you the video of Mactan. This is the value of air passengers to Cebu. Not just Mactan. So there is something that needs to be done here in terms of your airports. The contract for the extension of Mactan has been awarded. Okay, done deal. I'm saying, kulang pa. Set up another one. And I've pushed for that earlier. I'll push for it again. Medellin, Talagete, Toledo. Please, look elsewhere other than Cebu City. You have to have a fallback. When Tacloban Airport went down or Mok Airport remained operational, what's the difference? Taklobans on the east or Moks on the west. When we did the study of Samal Island, we found out that Samal Island's exposure to sea level rise and storm surge was on the east, but not on the west. Your airport is on the east. You don't have an airport on the west. Panay has five. Hindi ko yung Maybe you need someone else here to stir just mania and he's not pushing for another airport in Cebu. Come on. You need another one in the West. You need another one in the West. <laughs> uh, Cebu has to learn in terms of uh, land use how to live in a flood zone. Okay? There are technologies, some of which are already being adopted in Iluilo, for example, the es Esplanade. They're also looking at elevating the pedestrian walkways. I'm pushing for flood-free viaducts as well as no-build zones as Tacloban. This is very important. I said, disasters are man-made. You can prevent disasters. Remember, the people in Ormok drowned because they lived on the river. The people in Cagayan de Oro drowned because they lived in the river. Who wants to live in the river? <laughs> there are such things as no-build zones, please. Okay. 16 cities, number of motor vehicles, growth, 20 years. Who is number one? Cebu! <laughs> you need mass transit, ladies and gentlemen. You need mass transit badly. Badly. It does not have to be MRT. It can be BRT. It can be any RT. I don't care as long as it's mass transit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it cannot just be cars. One very, very bad case was Angeles City. There are 1,375 cars per square kilometer. My God, it's horrible. Because Clark doesn't have a mass transit, and many of them work inside Clark, so they have to all bring their own vehicle. In Iluilu City, we did the study for the city, trying to figure out how they can guarantee movement from the seaport to the airport through the city in all weather. <coughs> we looked at the city's road networks, and we identified these areas in red as the major arteries that were candidates to be all-weather networks. 
<coughs> not only for airport access, but also for food from the east and from the west. And that was the question we asked. How will it perform under Typhoon Frank conditions? Because everything we saw, the worst situation was Typhoon Frank. Okay, we layered the flood zones of Typhoon Frank. Uh-oh, many of the roads disappeared. <laughs> so we said, is there an all-weather route? Is it possible? Diba? And this is what we did. Together with the city, we drew up the areas that needed retrofitting. The areas in gray are the areas that go over the flood zones and need retrofitting improvement so that they can go above grade, so hindi na babahayin. The problem here is mahal. Ang dami niyan. So the city could not afford it. So we said, let's do it in phases. Maybe you should do it in phases. And so we helped the city identify what are the phases, what's the cheapest, what's the fastest, what's the most impact economically, and we decided to help them prioritize. Mayor Mobilog is supporting us with this one. Uh, we're not going to do it. He's going to do it. But we're giving him all the information so he can decide. I think this is something Cebu Canyon should do. It should. You know, I was once asking a taxi driver here in Cebu, Okay, I'm here. I was staying at the park lane at the time. I said, I'm here. I need to get back to the airport. If it's raining, where will you pass? Ah, sir, alam ko. Dito, 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 dito. So he knows what the old weather route is. He knows which overpasses to take, which areas to avoid. You know, so it's, 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 it's something which you should consider. If you want, if tourism is important to you, if business is important to you, that's something you should consider. People have to be able to get in and out. This is a KRA, definitely. You know, in Manila, they have overlooked that. Eh? Look, you know both NLEX and SLEX flood? Why? Why? Because the cities and the towns on the sides block the drains of the expressway. So the expressway is blocked. You know that all the cargo that comes out of Clark does not fly out through Clark? It flies out through Naia. It has to be driven to Manila via NLEX which floods. The cargo that comes from Batangas has to be brought in, the cars, the oil and gas, oh, it has to be brought in through SLEX, which floods. Major arteries should not flood. Should not flood. You've heard about the projects they have in Manila, where they're building all these new expressways and overpasses. What do you notice here? Everything is above grade. Everything is elevated. This is the lesson of Candaba Viaduct, which Marcos built 40 years ago. It works. If you were, <laughs> I was able to go up the Baguio before that was built, and I remember, we couldn't proceed because bumabahar yung Candaba area. But when they built that viaduct, it's five kilometers. Lana. There are many parts of the country, the Ilocos area, the areas of Iloilo, on the coastline, the area in Mindoro Occidental, which can use viaduct construction. And I, I've always felt, Government should pay for this. Private businessman must not suffer business disruption just because a, re a road floods. This is Cebu. That's your area of disruption. Retool for no downtime. Don't say it can't be done. That's not the way the Cebuano thinks. We must look at health. You see, Everything where it's happening in climate change will have an impact on health. <coughs> there will be the emergence of new diseases and the resurgence of old ones. These are some of the diseases we have seen. The late, latest has been Ebola. And people are panicking. <coughs> They're panicking. <coughs> Last week, there was a gossip going around that somebody was found in Ebola. Turns out it was not Ebola, it was MERS. MERS is pretty scary too. Um, and then there was a Nigerian that would die, Ebola daw, in there, it was malaria. <laughs> so, but malaria is scary too. <laughs> but they have all these things that are surrounding us. Now, normally nature is going to balance that. But we have altered nature so much, so much, that we have disrupted that natural regulation system. And therefore, it is clear to show that shifts in climate will rela rela uh, result in shifts in natural systems, infectious disease, and in public health. Uh, let's not forget, let's not forget that. Because this is going to affect productivity, this will affect uh, human capital, the, the workforce. The goal of all this is competitiveness. And if you are to be competitive, even in a sustainable way, 
you must be profitable. You must be cost effective. We have to look at the human footprint as well. You know, um, if uh, nations don't have an ecological bank statement, they tend to spend blindly. The Anthropocene is one example of that, where our ecological footprint, our carbon footprint, material footprint, our water footprint went through the roof. The Global Footprint Network uses a metric called the ecological footprint, which balances off our consumption of certain elements and shows how we're able to, and I look at other waste and how this can be processed by nature to bring back resources that we need to uh, live our lives. Globally, we have exceeded the ecological footprint already by 50%, the sustainable limits of our planet. Here in Asia Pacific, we have exceeded the sustainable limits of Asia Pacific by 77%. In the Philippines, we've exceeded the sustainable limits of our country by 117%. And Metro Manila, that I'm not proud of, has exceeded the sustainable limits of the NCR by 3,400%. Every Metro Manileño has a global footprint, uh, footprint of 1.7 global hectares. And lapad ng yapak ng taga Metro Manila, 1.7. And yet, he or she draws from a biocapacity of 0 0.05 global hectares. There's ways to manage global footprint, but it's a difficult decision. It's a decision we have to make. It has to do with slowing down economic growth or slowing down population growth. When people ask me, what defines sustainability in a climate-defined future? I tell them, think of six words, supply and demand, source and use, today and tomorrow. Think of the chains that connect supply to demand, the shared value chains that connect source to use, and think about how we tie in today, the way we will affect tomorrow. And that will give you a general idea of what sustainable development will be. A few years ago, the Philippine cabinet asked WWF to write a policy paper on sustainable consumption and production, and what the opportunities for our country would be toward achieving a green economy. In the course of that research, we found out that for the years 2000 to 2009, every increase in GDP was matched with an equivalent increase in resource extraction. That means for every notch that we went up, we drew one notch of natural capital from our inventory. When I looked, we looked at six other countries, all OECD. We noticed na hindi magkadikit yung graph nila. Na may puwang. And there is this red arrow between one line, the GDP line, and the other line. And we said, what's that? You know what it is? It's value added. And that's something we have to look at. Think CIF rather than simply FOB. Think in terms of how we can put money back into our economy, into our system, rather than selling it away or giving it away to Hong Kong Chinese or a Japanese or a Korean or a Vietnamese or a Thai or an American or a European or a Dutch. How do we have more here? Many years ago, Six Ross did a study of the urban poor in Manila, and when Dr. Rojas looked at the urban poor community, he found out that collectively they earn 25 million a year. But he found out that 95% of the money they earned was spent outside. So think about things, you start with things like, sana may magandang nagmamanicure dito, magaling magmanicure, dito na lang sa loob magmanicure, or sana may mag magaling maglaba, or whatever, so dito na lang sa loob, ibis na sa labas. Is there a way you can keep the money in? Increasing the internal velocity of money always increases the health of a small economy, of a local economy. And that's the whole idea of value added. If you're talking about fish, for example, ice, processing, packaging, transport. How many of these things in that chain can be improved such that it increases the livelihood of Filipinos rather than skilled somebody outside? Sustainability will involve the migration from a developing to an emerging to a developed economy. And that means really shifting from a dependence on pure extraction to more sustainable production levels, and finally to full transactional control. Have you ever visited a mine? 
Have you seen what ore looks like? Ore, ore looks like putik. It's dirt. It's earth. We're exporting dirt. So the point I'm trying to make here is can we process it somehow so we're earning a little more, more money for another Philippine firm or another Philippine? That's the whole idea behind achieving more sustainable production. All these things <coughs> we link up over the next 30 years, the demand for food, water, and energy are going to increase almost in parallel, 30 to 50 percent. And all of that will have an impact on another. It will be an increasingly complex situation. <coughs> we will live in a time of very confusing, very variable, very locally specific climate. And maybe one opportunity for Cebu is to be the center for added value. If that is your strength as a manufacturing and a processing center, as a trade center, maybe that is the opportunity for Cebuano. Figure out how you can lead the Visayas into being that center. Okay. Two days ago, the UN IPCC came out with a statement continued rise in world greenhouse gas emissions is increasing the likelihood of severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems. A combination of adaptation and substantial sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions can limit climate change risks. We're coming very, very close to an irreversible point. There's nothing much we can do except in our individual circumstances. As a nation, we don't have very much of emissions, globally speaking. But we're going to get hit, so the opportunity remains adaptation. We face a complex and very dynamic future. Following the tenets of complexity theory, you don't face a complex situation with a simple solution. You have to look at solutions that are multifaceted. The future demands us now to look at redundancies. Do you have a plan B? Do you have a plan C? Do you have a plan D? This will have to be the way things are done. People have said, we don't have the capacity. Ladies and gentlemen, capacity is my gift to a nation who wants to remain a nation of clerks. What this country needs is innovation, creativity, new ideas, new approaches. Capacity is used to fill out forms. It's not to drive our nation forward. Very often, in most of the cities we visited, Ponzi and the WWF team, we were told that governance, we need good governance. Governance is not government, it's you and I. There's another word for it, it's management. Democracy is not merely freedom, it is participation. And therefore, the key is going to be citizenship. Government cannot do this alone. And in Asia, the Philippines has a unique opportunity to show that they are ready to stand up and take our nation forward. Let me end with a short story of another city, New York. <coughs> you may be surprised to know that New York was not designed by local government. It was designed by the business sector. They paid for a city planner and then went to the governor, to the mayor and said, this is the city we want. You build it, we will invest. That, for me, is the genius of the Mega Cebu Consortium whole idea that business can move things forward. Business can move things forward. We cannot allow ourselves to remain subservient to political infighting. Because that does not contribute to the public good. Now, this is something that we, as citizens, as voters and taxpayers, have to take up on our own. Sometimes, people have to do that. But let me just end 
with one small thought. You may decide to make the money and run. You'll get away with it for a while. You may decide, oh no, I'll just go ahead and do my own business and just go up into a pakasyonan in the mountains and I would never get hit by sea level rise. And I'll make it very tough so hindi siya maanan pag yun. Yeah, it's possible. <coughs> but ultimately, you know, we have to learn how to work together and how to live together because we have no choice. This is an image called the Blue Marble, taken by US spacecraft as they were flying over the moon and they saw the Earth. And it drives home the message here that we have only one planet and one future. Thank you.